All right, again, today's talk on compassion and compassion fatigue. This was a requested talk uh, by our friends in Hibbing. And uh, actually, I see some new faces on here today that I got a couple of messages that it was something that they thought would be really helpful. And I think it, I think it will be. So next slide. All right, coming up next week, the Charlie Resnikoff is uh, going to be presenting on tobacco. And you can see that the schedule has filled up quite nicely. All right, remember there's free CME. You just got to fill out that thing when Katie sends it to you. Again, feel free to turn on your, your uh, video. It'd be nice to see everybody's face and uh, it's much easier to, to talk to faces. So it'd be great. Technical assistance, that's how you can reach out for anything of any kind. Um, Aaron will probably be your number one go-to moving forward. All right. And remember, there's all kinds of online stuff, and you can find that at the core website. Uh, anything that you want as far as the old echoes and other things can be found there. So feel free to check out the website as well. All right, I guess I'm I'm up because it's my talk. Um, so yeah, this was a this was something that somebody had asked about, and, and I got to be honest, I had no idea. I'd never heard the term uh, compassion fatigue, so it was uh, I think kind of a learning experience for me as well. Uh, and it, it's interesting, and I'll even talk about this a little bit at the end. A, a friend I had who uh, had some issues uh, that had called me a year or two ago, long before I really knew about this kind of stuff. Um, I don't know, Katie, do you want me to try and share or do you want to just go along with me? Because it might be easier just since it's up. All right. So understand that the uh, the objectives, again, we want to talk a little bit about compassionate care uh, and how we get better patient satisfaction and kind of doctor-patient relationships. We're going to talk a little bit about the clinical and environmental and things and family factors that can really contribute to how somebody is as far as their compassion fatigue uh, and what kind of protects us from that sometimes and understand that there's there's limitations right and um and there's current definitions a lot of these things that people actually uh argue about a little bit and uh we'll talk about that in just a moment all right next slide so one of the interesting things is, is there's a group of people who are actually doing uh, a fair amount of research on compassion fatigue. It's a, there's a ton of stuff out about compassion fatigue. And then there's a group of people who are doing research on compassion. Uh, and there's not a lot written about compassion, which I think is really pretty interesting. It, and they are they seem to have a bit of a chip on their shoulder uh, about people who do compassion fatigue work because they don't feel like compassion has really been studied enough that we should go to the next step. And so it's really quite interesting. Um, so there, there's a lot of knowledge about compassionate caring, and they know that there's much better patient uh, patient satisfaction. There's better doctor-patient relationships. And, and actually, patients just do better overall if they feel like the provider they're seeing is actually compassionate. So I think uh, really an interesting, an interesting thing. Next slide. So first, we're going to start with some definitions. And I, I, I would have to say if I'd have to written if I had to write down a month or two ago before I really spent a lot of time on this, the difference between empathy and compassion, I'm not sure I'd have been great at it um, because I really didn't, I don't think I understood the intricacies of what's different between the two. And, and empathy is more just being able to take the perspective of another person, understand their, that they're having discomfort or they're suffering in some way. Uh, whereas next slide, then when we talk about um, Next slide, Katie. And when we talk about compassion, compassion is like that next step, right? So you you have to have some empathy for the situation that a patient is in, but they, taking that step of actually wanting to relieve their suffering or improve them is is really that that next thing that would that would lead to compassion. So empathy and compassion are related and they're interwoven, but they're not they're not the same thing. And I think often uh, we think that they are. Next slide. Now, why do people have compassion? Well, it's interesting because even when we look at our cousins, uh, the chimpanzees, 
they actually tend to be fairly compassionate to each other. Uh, and I, I hate to say this, but I was watching something about chimps on Netflix and one of them was sick and, and the other ones were comforting him. And I, and I, it was interesting when I came across all of this stuff of how actually chimpanzees are one of the few mammals that actually will show compassion for one of their, one of their own when they're hurt uh, or they have some kind of thing, but it is a relatively complex you know, adaptive kind of thing. Uh, you know, my my wife has horses. I, we just recently had a horse that was sick and then died. The other horses didn't seem to really care in that they they didn't hang around. Uh, but, you know, they certainly were confused uh, when that horse passed away. And I, I think that it's just different when when you actually go to somebody and you're actually trying to take care of them or relieve their suffering. So it is at a level of, of probably the apes and different things like that, where we'll, we'll see some of this hardwired uh, compassion. Next slide. And one of the things that the compassion people don't like is the, the words compassion fatigue. And they have, you know, they basically in, in this paper by the compassion people, they talked about, you know, yeah, we get it. Compassion fatigue is kind of a specific type of burnout uh, that follows kind of exposure, like repeated exposure, exposure to trauma and suffering. But it, it's interesting, you know, that they don't really like the name. You know, they agree that people who have what is called compassion fatigue may have behavioral and cognitive changes, but the name doesn't seem to fit the problem in their in their mind. Next slide. And, and here's the, you know, here's the thing is that we know again, and they agree that when we see troubles with empathy and compassion, that, that people don't work as well, they may not have the best judgment, they may be a bit apathetic, um, they may be dissatisfied. At an institutional level, if we have a lot of employees working in our in our hospital or our clinic and they're and they're losing their compassion. Clearly, uh, some of these people are going to leave the institution. We're going to have decreased production. And so it's from a workforce standpoint, uh, certainly this is a bit of an issue. So, so again, they agree with the fact that there's something that happens when people lose their empathy and compassion, but they don't like the words. And here's why. Next slide. Um, one of the things that bothers the compassion group is that fatigue would imply that we would only have a certain amount of compassion. So it, it's like you run out of it. And, and we clearly don't run out of it. Um, and in fact, if you look at the age of the provider, it seems that people as they age actually have less compassion fatigue. Uh, so it's really the opposite. It's like you don't really run out of it. It's not like one day all of a sudden it's like, yeah, I'm not going to be friendly anymore. Uh, I've, I've just totally run out of my compassion. As, as people age, they actually seem to do better. And, and there's some theories as to why that is. Next slide. Um, so, so why less compassion fatigue? Well, I think, uh, you know, and I'm one of the, probably one of the elder statesmen here in the group of, of, of people, everybody's much younger, but uh, the thought is that as people age, they kind of learn how better to manage things. They tend to have better support um, and support around them. And often they learn to, carp carp I can never say that, put things into compartments, compartmentalize things a little bit better, and they are able to go away from work uh, and, and not bring the work home with them as much. Uh, and I do think that's hard, I think, especially in one of the reasons we're doing this talk is, of course, in addiction work, uh, sometimes we just hear some terrible, terrible stories and things that it's just that often you'll find your, yourself taking home with you. And... Uh, and it's having that support system where you can talk to people, talk to the other employees that sometimes allows that. The thought is that as, if providers are much younger, they may not have that support. Uh, they may not have learned some of these skills of how to, how to kind of self-manage some of these stressful events that we run into. Next slide. Uh, the other thing is that, that compassion fatigue implies that it's tiring, right? That, that we're just tired of being compassionate. And in fact, it, it's it's increased that it's 
you get increased social connections if you're compassionate. And they've shown that that if a person has a normal amount of compassion, that they'll have very good social connections, that they tend not to think of themselves as much. And, and that helps buffer you kind of against the stress. So it's, again, uh, it's not tiring. And in fact, having compassion often could give us more connections uh, if we uh, if we are not overly stressed with it. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the things down the road here that can often kind of beat us down and kind of put us in a mode where it's very difficult to continue being compassionate. Next slide. Now, the compassion people often look at this as a transactional model. And what that means is that, that they're looking at uh, transactional meaning kind of an exchange or an interaction between people. And so in the model of the, in, in kind of the, the most popular model of compassion is that it's kind of a function of a few different things is to how good we are at compassion or whether or not uh, we can maintain our compassion. Uh, some of that uh, dealing with the function of the physician characteristics. So all of us are different and all of us have different abilities to manage stress. All of us have different um you know, working situations, whether it's ER or radiology or dermatology or addiction. Uh, so there's many parts of, of our day that can affect whether or not we, we can actually show that compassion. And again, it can also be affected by the institutional setting, where we work, um, how things are going, whether we feel like we're important to the, to the system. Um, so really, this physician characteristics are a little bit uh, different, and we're going to kind of list some of those things that make a little bit of a difference. Next slide. So it's really this transactional model is kind of emphasizing kind of that interplay between the person and their environment and how each of these areas can affect it. Next slide. So looking at the um, provider side of this, the provider clearly is one of the biggest variables. Uh, and, and a lot of it can be related to lots of different things and experiences that a provider's had. The environmental side uh, is, can, is a lot of different things. It can be the patient's family. And we all know that when we walk in a room and, our, and the family just attacks us immediately about what we're going to do and how are we going to fix this, that can affect how the rest of the whole meeting goes if we don't have good communication skills and how to, how to kind of manage that kind of pressure. Uh, the clinical situation, whether we're in an ER or we're sitting in an exam room, uh, whether it's noisy, uh, and that whole physical environment, you know, uh, can can play into that. And, and also the, the institutional demands. Are we being stretched so thin? Do we not have enough staff? How tired are we? Have we been working extra shifts? And I think COVID was the kind of the perfect storm for this kind of a thing. And I And I think that Obviously, I, I think that uh, compassion fatigue was, was a big part of what happened in some of the big hospitals that were overwhelmed during COVID. Next slide. Um, so how does our personality really affect whether or not we're compassionate or not? You know, with, and, and really when we look at the different things that could sh they'll show whether or not we're going to have a, a pretty steady compassion ability, uh, being overly critical is, is typically not a good thing. Obviously, in the addiction world, it's judgmental versus tolerance. Uh, our past clinical experiences, I mean, have we had similar problems to what our patients have? And, uh, you know, you're working in an ER and your, your family was killed a year ago in a car accident and you see car accidents. How does that, your previous experiences, how does that play into how you approach each problem? Um, and again, our communication skills. And I, I think we all know that the ability to diffuse a situation, uh, especially with families who, who have a certain expectation that we're going to whip in there and we're going to just solve all their problems immediately in the exam room or, or in an emergency department. And so how able you are to kind of traverse that, that communication issue can make a big difference. And again, our personal history, you know, did we have issues in our family that played into it? Are we having family issues now? Um, you know, it, and I think uh, even your medical history, if you're having, it's very hard for people when they're having medical problems to sometimes deal with other, but other people's medical problems. So all of these different things that are a part of each of us can play into how we are able to manage the patients in our day. Next slide. I guess that's supposed to be good eggs and bad eggs there. And this is just an example 
Um, if we get a depressed teenager who's in the ED and and uh, they're in there because they overdose and they got Narcan and uh, they're in there and and the provider's tired, he's stressed, he just worked an extra shift, you know, his his discussion might be very short and and very much like here's what we're going to do for you. We're going to set you up with somebody over in behavioral health and they're going to take care of this. They're going to see you next week and and they just are trying to move them out of the bed. They don't have time to really engage the patient. They don't have the energy to engage the patient. Whereas we might get somebody, not necessarily a new grad, but somebody who's well-rested. Uh, maybe they had a history themselves of depression and it had some difficulties or have people in their family who've had those difficulties. They may take a much different approach to that patient, knowing how that patient feels and understanding, being able to put themselves in that person's place, right? I've been here before. Uh, you know, I, I know how hard this is. You know, let's see what we can do to fix it. And they may keep that person in the ER a little bit longer as they as they try and manage the follow up and make sure this patient gets taken care of. Uh, and I, you know, very obviously in addiction, we see this uh, constantly where our patients are, you know, sometimes in the ER and do not get taken care of the way we would hope. And then the next time they see a different provider and boom, they're on Suboxone. They got all the referrals made. And, and I often ask myself, I wonder if that if that uh, provider has a little issue in their family and and understands this patient a little bit better. Next slide. Um, so the patient and family factors, again, I, I can't tell you how many times I've went into a room or been in an emergency department in my career and family members set the tone very immediately in the room. And it's it's very easy to just get upset and defensive. But I think it's much better often to try and diffuse that situation, try to make people understand things take time. You don't have enough information yet. Let's just sit down and talk about what's going on. If you walk in and say, I don't think you're, you really need to be here with this problem, clearly things are going to go poorly, right? And so, you know, some providers, you know, try and show that compassion, but it's it's very much easier with certain patients than others. And I think we all know this. We run into certain patients and it's very tough uh, to really connect with them or feel that compassion for them. And so we always have to remember that some families are going to be easier than others. And, and we'll feel that in ourselves. We'll feel that, that stress or that anger. Uh, we may even get resentful because of what's going on in the room. And sometimes it'll be very difficult to go back in that room. Uh, I certainly have patients that are very difficult. And it's always it's always hard to get yourself in those rooms to kind of have those first those first conversations to try and make sure it doesn't go sideways, because often there's a certain group of patients that will be more difficult. Next slide. And I think that um, stigma, and this probably should say stigma factors, um, but clinical factors can challenge an ability to be compassionate. Um, and I would say that, you know, again, we see this in, in the alcohol patients and the drug uh, drug use patients that go to our emergency rooms, but even in, in people who are overly, you know, overweight, uh, maybe they have problems associated with their weight, or maybe it's a, a chronic pain patient that ends up in the ER, and it's very difficult for somebody to, to really put themselves in their in their place. And often it's because we feel like, hey, if it wasn't for their unhealthy behavior, for instance, getting lung cancer from smoking, they wouldn't even be in here. So this is really their fault. And it's very difficult then to try to kind of find that, that connection with the patient and be compassionate when you feel it's their fault, right? Um, and not think about some of the other things. And so I think we all have to look at ourselves and say, when we go in certain rooms, do we have a different approach or do we say things that we normally wouldn't say to other patients? And, and how is that affecting the relationship between us and the patient? Next slide. So there's, there's uh, again, other clinical factors that can kind of affect our ability to be compassionate. And, and I think that most definitely the complexity of a patient can be an issue. Whenever we get these patients, and it is just so difficult to figure out multiple things and how they interplay, that often it's just easier to back away or to, to try to, you know, some way uh, get out of the situation, especially in patients with a lot of comorbidities, or they have findings that are unexplained. You, you get back a bunch of things that are abnormal and you don't know quite what to do with it. It's easier to punt that patient onto somebody than to really sit with them and talk with them and get more history, uh, run through all this stuff. And so patients like this, they'll take a lot of energy 
will make it much more difficult to continue your compassionate ways. So next slide. And, you know, and I think this is really true. When, when, when we have these situations, we tend to detach a little bit and that's that, and just become analytical and start talking about numbers and tests and not so much about how does a patient feel about this or, you know, are you okay with the discussion we had? Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? And is there things that you don't understand about what I told you? So again, I think that often when we're not sure what's going on, it's easier to detach a little bit and just say, we're going to get you with one of the specialists and we're going to just move on and not have a conversation that might uh, calm their fears a little bit more and maybe give them more information about what you might be looking for or the potential good or bad things that might be going on. So again, I think it's easy to, to have that step, especially if they're very complex and we've got a very difficult family. Next slide. Um, and I think this is just an aside, really. If you if you look at the type of job we all get in, is it somewhat self-selected because of whether or not we're able to be compassionate? And I and I often think about the radiologists who, you know, in the old days, they didn't do a lot of procedures. They just sat in a back room that was dark. They just looked at these, looked at these EK or excuse me, x-rays and scans and just gave their opinion and never really had much patient. Um interaction and did they select that type of a job because they feel uncomfortable or they have difficulty showing compassion um, or do people pick being a trauma surgeon because they're not bothered by other people's suffering do they have less empathy and they're much able to tolerate that uh, and I'll give a little example of that in, in a friend of mine who I got a call about a little bit later when we talk about things that that reasons why some people don't get compassion fatigue, uh, which was my friend. Okay, next slide. Um, and so again, environmental factors, you know, how how loud and noisy is it? How easy is it to have a discussion with a patient uh, and show empathy or show compassion when there's a trauma in the next in the next bay? Um, and you've got to document everything and you don't have time and you you don't have a scribe, which uh, I think we all wish we had. But uh, and, and just the paperwork. And so we have a lot of other time constraints that make it very difficult for us to, to spend a lot of time with the patient to show them that, that in fact, we really care about how they're doing and, and whether or not they're doing well. So understand, and this is different in everybody's job. Some of us uh, have more time. Some of us have less time to have these conversations. Next slide. So before we move on to... Um, compassion fatigue, we're going to have a little review here on compassion, just to kind of pull the compassion all together. But are there interventions that can change it? You know, how how do we become more compassionate? Uh, well, there certainly are some interventions. Next slide. And, you know, are these things that you just uh, call your boss and say, hey, I'd like to go through this, this course? Uh, not so much. Uh, but there's been a lot of studies that have shown that with mindfulness and meditation, probably yoga. Yoga seems to be one of those things that's in everything. And uh, I, I don't find myself doing yoga anytime soon. But, you know, different ways of finding self-awareness uh, and, and improving communication can make people more empathetic and more likely to aid a sufferer. Uh, next slide. Um, some of these interventions are actually more kind of Buddhist like where, you know, this informed compassion meditation. So they actually meditate on on how they can be better and how how you would actually go about showing more compassion and feeling what a patient feels. Next slide. Um, so we're going to just kind of wrap up some of the compassion stuff. And again, just understanding that that this is a feeling that occurs when you see somebody else suffering and it motivates us to help. So empathy is just maybe noticing it, but compassion is when you take the next step. And I think next slide, if you wanna just break it down into a couple different things that conceptually it, it's gonna have five components. And again, part of it is the empathy, the ability to recognize that suffering um, and understanding that everybody's going to suffer. We're all gonna suffer from something. There's just none of us that are gonna escape that. And that you just have to have that ability to feel for that person and, and tolerating you have to be able to tolerate that people are uncomfortable. I mean, think about the people in the ERs that are working there day in and day out. You have to still be able to do your work knowing that somebody's uncomfortable. And, uh, but yet you're motivated to alleviate 
they're suffering in some way. Next slide. Um, but, and, but again, just to emphasize that empathy and compassion are interwoven. Uh, I, I don't know how you would separate them, uh, but there are people that can be empathetic that do nothing and walk by. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I just read this thing on I, one of the large mountains that somebody was climbing and somebody was dying and a group walked past them, right? So they stopped and talked to them. They were clearly empathetic, but kept going because they were trying to summit, right? So they were clearly showing empathy, but not enough to stop them so that they didn't try to go up the mountain. Uh, so they were not compassionate and they took quite a bit of heat for that. Um, so it is, it's being able to perceive those feelings, but yet do something. Next slide. So this is the definition of compassion fatigue. It was first described in, and there's a few definitions. And I'll tell you, there's a lot of people that are doing different types of uh, research on this. But the first guy who came up with this was uh, a guy by the name of Johnson. And this was in 1992 that he wrote a paper. And he felt that this was kind of a physical and mental exhaustion, right? That it, that's caused by this depleted ability to cope with one's everyday environment. And that's not necessarily just a medical worker. Think about policemen, think about firemen, paramedics, people that are dealing with, uh, you know, some of these very difficult situations uh, every single day. Next slide. Some people um, tend to focus on this profound exhaustion, right? And some of the literature talks about that. And then how many different psychological issues can arise behaviorally, cognitively, some physical disorders, right? The people that just continue repeatedly to uh, have to be empathetic and compassionate. Again, ER always, you know, comes to mind uh, because they're all around these traumatized, suffering individuals. And so it's it's just so much that they can only take it so long. Next slide. Um, and then there has been some thought that this, the natural consequence of these behaviors and emotions, you know, that even just being aware of somebody being traumatized uh, can result in you developing some compassion fatigue. And for instance, social workers who may not actually see the patient when they were initially uh, interviewed when they had a particular event, but yet they hear the story and they and they find that overwhelmingly stressful. And so, and then they want to step in and they want to help as well. Uh, and I think that that often even just hearing it well after it happened, and, and many of us who do some of the addiction work and we'll run into patients with really complicated and difficult to hear um, sexual assaults and things like that can be very very difficult. And, and often there's not much you can do. We send them to a trauma therapist or we do something else. Uh, in a way, I think that always makes me feel more helpless, that there's really nothing you can do at that point. Next slide. So there's individual factors um, that would somewhat set you up to develop compassion fatigue. And one of those things is really feeling like you've always got to absolutely do your best, right? You're, you've got these high expectations uh, that you're going to give just super quality, high care, and, and people still die, and people still have trauma, and people still have not a perfect life. And so it's uh, sometimes that expectation we have is that what we can do for the patient that can really set us up for failure. Uh, again, personal unsolved traumas, the, the uh, ER doctor, for instance, who uh, lost his family in a, in a car accident, going back to work, and then seeing those same kinds of things in the ER could be very difficult for a person uh, to be able to deal with those uh, early on and getting that when those, when those patients are coming in. And, and again, people with poor social support. So if you come home and you can't say to the people in your house or your friends and say, wow, here's this experience I had, and I don't know what you'd do, but I, you know, I'm really struggling with this. And having that ability to share that uh, and offload it a little bit uh, is, is a good thing. And if you can't, clearly that's going to be an issue. And, and often these are also people who have coping issues, right? They've already had these traumatic experiences. They don't have anybody to particularly help them or support them. And so their coping may be different. And often in, in, the, in the case of compassion fatigue, it, it may lead to substance use such as alcohol, right? Or people kind of self-medicate. Next slide. Um, and, and the other things, of course, that set you up for it is repeated trauma, right? That you're exposed to. It's this day in and day out 
And, and I always think about, uh, you know, Vietnam and the people working in the mass units, the things that they saw, the things that were repetitive. Uh, and if you have poor teamwork and you're, you're basically set up for failure, I mean, obviously it's going to make that worse. Um, I think often uh, people bury themselves in work and they may not have a good work-life balance. And that's been shown as well to be a professional factor that may make a difference as a, whether or not you'll develop compassion fatigue. Next slide. Uh, and these are just organizational factors, and I'm not going to really belabor these. Uh, I mean, I think we all know that, uh, you know, if you don't enjoy where, you know, where you work or what you do, it's going to make it harder for you to be compassionate to the people that you see. And and often it's that, I think, the lack of control of change, right, that you see. And I'll give an example of that. Um, I saw a young man when, when I was still in Little Falls who wanted to go to treatment. We got it all set up. He was ready to go. Uh, we had we needed a rule 25 on a Friday afternoon, and they would not allow a, our staff member who was qualified to do it to do it from the county. They scheduled him for a week out, and he was using heroin at the time. He was um, really wanted to go to treatment and get away from the situation he was in, which was basically he was like an indentured servant. And he hung himself the next day because we couldn't get him into treatment. Right? Could I change that? No, tried to change that. Um, and fortunately, Rule 25s are not a big thing now, but four or five years ago, I changed a person's life and I changed the life of his family. So uh, I think sometimes that lack of control to be able to change or, or, or modify how things work uh, can also be difficult. Next slide. So there was a recent review article and it kind of gave more of a comprehensive list of the symptoms, right? So how do we know, you know, if we're developing this? I mean, and can you look at yourself and go, man, I think I'm having a little trouble. Um, and, and as we are working too much, and, and to be clear, the word burnout comes out a lot in this literature and nobody can agree really on if burnout is actually compassion fatigue or whether they're the same or they're different. Uh, but the reality is that, when physicians are often in trouble and they're working and working and working, they may not do as good a job. They may have poor concentration. They may be very anxious. They might be irritable, difficult to work with. Uh, and, and, and it just can be uh, something that snowballs as, uh, as, as time goes on. And so I think we need to, we need to always think about this as we look at ourselves, you know, am I working too much? Do I have good life balance? You know, am I treating everybody at work the right way or treating them nicely? And I think that often that can be uh, kind of that those clues. And, and you know, we can also see this in our in the people we work with, uh, especially if uh, the pace is fast and and they're not doing well. Next slide. Um, and again, these are some other less seen kind of things, you know, people losing kind of their spirituality, some difficulties with personal relationships, um, a lot of interpersonal conflict, especially at work. And uh, often these people will just be exhausted. They'll show up for their shift and they're already wiped out. They don't think they can take it. Uh, and the day is, uh, you know, days blown all the way right from the start. Uh, and so uh, these are things, again, you have, that you want to think about as your day goes. Next slide. So what are the organizational consequences? And I don't know that this is the most important thing, but I think that systems obviously think about this. And what we want or what everybody should want is if they're having an issue with their burnout or their compassion fatigue, that their organization would recognize it's important to make sure that, they, that they're that they doing well, because that that's what really affects the bottom line. If if there's consequences of a lot of people in your in your system having compassion fatigue, you're not you're not going to have good job performance. You're going to have a lot of mistakes, right? Safety issues. You're going to have people moving to different jobs, quitting. So, so from an organizational standpoint, really, the organizations should really be looking out for their employees, trying to make sure that they're doing okay, so that the patients do okay and the patients get uh, the get the help that uh, patients get the help they need and the and the employees get the help that they need. Next slide. So how do we combat it? Well, I, really the first thing is acknowledging that it exists. Uh, I think that in the smaller systems, there's probably less organization around this. Uh, 
I do know that in, in our organization, there are there are some things that can be done if you feel like you're really struggling uh, or having uh, difficulties at your job. And it's really important that the leaders in your and the leadership in your in your group can really be trained to kind of identify it. You know, do we need to change what you're doing day to day? Do we need to diversify your caseloads? Do we need to get you out of a particular area and move you into an, another area because where you're at is not working for you? And so uh, there are a lot of different ways to combat it, uh, but probably number one is recognizing it. Next slide. And, and really, it's no big surprise that if you're trying to combat something like this, that's, you know, a really a mental health issue. It's about education and self-awareness. It's that whole resilience training, again, that we talked about, the meditation. And, and really, again, it's about coming forward and saying something or having somebody come to you and say, I'm, I'm worried about you. And, and here's what I think that we should do. Um, one of the things that's really, I think, improved things, it's been shown to improve things is debriefing after really significant trauma cases. So when people uh, run into something that's really particularly rough, um, to have a sit down with everybody involved and, and be able to share that. Uh, one of the really saddest cases I ever saw, uh, I I took care of in the emergency room, a two-year-old who drowned in a bathtub uh, and mom had actually gone uh, and answered the phone and the kid fell in the bathtub and uh, had drowned and they got brought in. And I, and I think our team worked on that, that youngster for almost an hour and the child died. And, and looking back, I think, wouldn't it have been a good thing for us to all sit down and kind of talk about how that made us feel because it was particularly uh, difficult. I can see that whole situation like it was yesterday, and it was it was almost 20 years ago. So uh, I do think debriefing is something that has come out of this whole combating compassion fatigue, and I think it's a good thing. Next slide. So again, interventions, there's very few studies. Uh, a lot of work needs to be done on what works best. Uh, but, you know, everybody, I think, in general would say self-care is probably the most important thing uh, and work-life balance and having the ability to talk to people. Uh, next slide. Um, it's interesting because there are some people who don't develop compassion fatigue, right? They uh, they just don't ever seem to have trouble. Uh, and I And again, these are people that have those specific kind of um, things that we talked about earlier, but one of the big things is, is that they are able to ask for help. And by asking for help, if they're overwhelmed, asking for help in the ER, asking for help when they're struggling, maybe seeing a, a counselor, um, and they have kind of personal strategies for in place for self-care. And that might be exercise, that might be, and I hate to say it again, yoga or something like that. But I think you know, we all have our own thing. I get up in the morning, and go running, and that's really where I kind of sort things out for the day. Uh, and I have a running partner who's also in the healthcare, um, and and I think it helps to be able to bounce things off somebody every day. And and there are many times one of us has had a really traumatic event, and uh, and we'll chat about it. And I think that that's really very helpful. Optimistic people tend to have much less trouble with compassion fatigue. Um, uh, if you're in the middle, I'm probably more in the middle of that. So I'm probably a bit of a setup and also having those boundaries at work and at home. So doing work at home or not doing work at home, can we totally cut ourselves off from work and the thoughts and things that, that happened at work? Next slide. Um, as an aside, there's actually studies that have shown that there's personality traits not associated with compassion fatigue. Um, and I think it's really interesting. The part of this that I find interesting is really uh, the lack of empathy, right? That there's there's just some people that don't have empathy. And I'll, and I'll tell you a story of a friend of mine who's also in healthcare who called me probably a year or two ago. Uh, and I went to college with him as well, and I ran with him. And uh, he was uh, kind of a, a bit of a loner. He, he was a tow walker. He was a tow runner. and But he was one of those guys that uh, didn't need to, he was like a cat. He didn't need to have friends, right? He we did things with him, but he kind of did his own thing. Well, unfortunately for my friend, uh, a couple of years back, his brother committed suicide. And his wife was standing there, took the phone call, handed him the phone. They tell him the story that his, that his brother had killed himself. He has no emotion about it at all. Hangs up. And his wife says, what, what happened? He said, well, my wife or my, uh, my brother killed himself. And I've got to go clean up because they're, you know, it's 
they they can't leave the apartment like it is, right? So, and she said, well, you're not going to cry. You're not going to, and he's like, well, what am I supposed to do? He's dead. There's, there's nothing. And and she right away recognized, you know, she'd always kind of had a little bit of a thought that maybe something was awry. And I don't know if he, he particularly had um, psycho, psychopathic tendencies because he he's not a really excessive self-love or any of these other things, but he has a son with Asperger's, right? And so he goes and sees a, a therapist and him and his wife, and he sits down and the guy says, well, you know, when did they diagnose you beyond the spectrum? And he says, I don't know, what are you talking about? And he says, well, you know, you're a toe walker, you, this whole story, you know, and eventually they decided that he actually had very mild Asperger's, um, but it sometimes it even looks like some of this stuff, right? Where he just didn't have the empathy. And he actually took courses to learn how to be empathetic to his patients. He actually, he, he called me, he said, you know, do you think I've got this? And I said, well, to be honest with you, now that I look back, it, it all kinds of fits, right? Next slide. And so I also put the, you know, if people are a little bit on the spectrum, they can be very smart, very sharp, very good providers, but yet they maybe have, uh, they don't feel it. And one of the problems he had was patients would say, I'm having pain. And he would be like, yeah, whatever, right? Okay, I'll give you a little more of this or that. And so he actually took courses to learn how to do that. Um, and so a lot of different things with the, the dark triad that could be associated with this. But again, often it's that lack of empathy. It can be substance use, distrust, and antisocial behavior. He really didn't have any of these other things so much. But um, again, I, I don't know if he would just be a person that had a little less empathy and maybe had mild Asperger's. But I think these are things that these people sometimes are very productive physicians or providers because they don't feel it. They they keep moving, but they're not so good. Uh, we often hear that where people say, well, he's a great surgeon, but he's he's not, his bedside manner is terrible, right? Uh, that's this person, right? They do a great job. They're very specific, but yet they maybe have trouble connecting. Next slide. So in summary, um, you know, I think we need to understand that compassion is really important to help understand empathy and compassion fatigue. So we need to kind of think about compassion first. Um, you know, there's a lot of different definitions and it's not like one person has compassion and they don't. It's obviously a spectrum of compassion. And I think we can always uh, improve how we how we talk with patients and and um, and really work with them. But there's really going to have to be a lot more studies to kind of uh, validate kind of the evaluation and treat, especially treatments. How do we, if we're having trouble and somebody is having compassion fatigue, how do we retool them and get them back into the workforce and make them better and more resilient? So uh, next slide, I think we're done. So, so obviously I'd be happy to entertain questions. I'm certainly not an expert, but it's, uh, I, to me, this was very fascinating. Um, uh, yeah, there's a, Little something there. It says compassion fatigue and moral injury when the uh, challenges of simultaneously knowing what care patients need, but being unable to provide it due to constraints beyond a caregiver's control. Yeah. Um, put them together for too long and you get burnout. And that and that is true. And I think a lot of times it's that uh lack of control of uh prior authorizations, right? <laughs> it's like we can we can't control it. I, we had three hours, a nurse on the phone is three hours today. You can't control some things and it's being able to let those things go. Any other question that I had? Oh, go ahead, Charlie. Oh, I'll be quick. I actually have to go. Our clinic starts at one, but this was awesome. And I just want to plug for next week as I'm reading about tobacco cessation. Tobacco has previously been thought of as like psychological. I smoke when I'm stressed out. You know, I smoke in response to all these emotional things. And patients will still talk about quitting as a factor of like their emotions or their condition or what's happening in their life. But it is now clearly known that tobacco and tobacco cessation is not emotional. You do not need compassion to help someone quit smoking. It's a pharmacologic physiologic event. You need medications. You need certain specific advice. So I'm just, a part of me is also being the devil's advocate. Tobacco is obviously different from opioids or other drugs, but in tobacco, you don't need compassion. Like you just don't. You need a pharmacologic intervention and a strategic lifestyle change 
and you need to talk to them every time about it. You don't want to be judgmental. You need to be non-judgmental, but that doesn't mean you have to be compassionate. So anyways, part of my devil's advocate question is um, how much of what we're doing is really, we just need to get them the meds they need. We need to be non-judgmental and get them the meds they need. And maybe they don't need compassion. Maybe they just need their refill. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my dad. I don't think that's true, but it's true for tobacco. Uh, anyways, what are your what are your thoughts? You know, that that's really interesting because, you know, there's a there's a lot of studies that show that you have. Well, it's really the question would be, what is your goal? Now, if your goal is monetary, uh, monetary, like as a system, we know that patients are happier if somebody shows them compassion and they're more likely to come back. And so. Again, that surgeon who nobody likes, and I've worked with many, um, and they're not compassionate, but they're great surgeons, people still see them. So it's like, do you need compassion to be successful? Probably not in all cases, but do you need, com you know, is compassion necessary to keep patients coming back to you specifically as a primary care? Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think that if they, if there's better patient satisfaction, the system will be happier. So maybe what we're treating is the system. <laughs> yeah, I think relationships are important. Yeah. You, you got to relate to the person. Uh, so anyways, that was my devil's advocate. Great talk. See you next week. All right. Thanks. Uh, was there another question in the chat? I didn't. Oh, that was Charlie. Yeah. It's a bridge to good relationships. Yep. Yeah. My question is, when you were prepping for this talk, did you find anything on telehealth and compassion fatigue and if it sort of preserves clinicians from becoming burnt out because they aren't having that physical response to someone struggling in the room with them? Yeah, I did not see one thing on telehealth. I mean, I probably would have had to, that. Would be, that would actually be a great topic is what's the patient and physician and provider experience on telehealth. Because for me, frankly, I don't like doing it. Um, I like being in a room with somebody. I just, I just don't like the telehealth. Do I do it? I do for patients who live a long ways away, but I don't think it's ever as good an experience that when I'm in the room with them. So, so if they interviewed me, that's what I'd say. What what do patients think? I don't know. That that's we're gonna have to write that on the list and and maybe look into that. All right, any other questions? We just got a few minutes left. You know, there is one thing where you mentioned, you know, the, the smoker or whatever. I mean, I love taking care of patients in group homes, and it's partly because they're not at fault for why they're there. Mm -hmm. And the elephant in the room is we, we rarely talk to people about, hey, you know, if you hadn't drank too much and eaten too much and smoked too much, you wouldn't be in this situation. There, yeah. there's a flip side to I mean, you can be compassionate about it, but but we never recognize patients role and how they got there or very rarely. And I think we actually do a disservice by by not recognizing it. Yeah, it's tough that, you know, you know, I can think of, uh, you know, many of them like that where, you know, they drank themselves in, uh, you know, really to the edge of death and uh, ended up in a group home or a, or a nursing home actually. And, you know, do you ever have that discussion with them? And yeah, I'd say I, I didn't. Yeah. I, I never did. But uh, I mean, there's a reason why Dean Wormer's um, line to flounder, you know, son, fat, drunk, and stupid is no way to go through life resonates with people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no, good point. <laughs> I haven't used those exact words, but yeah. Uh, Lana, I would imagine that having a bias with OUD would impact how compassionate you can be as a clinician too. And, and I think that's a hundred percent true. Um, and, and we have these discussions with patients all the time about their buprenorphine. And one of the things people hate about buprenorphine is when they go to the ER or a different clinician and they notice that, and that's the first thing they say. Oh, you're on you're on Suboxone, uh, so you've had tr you've had addiction problems. And sometimes it's pain, right? Sometimes they're on for pain or both, or and and but they pick that medicine. They don't say, oh, you're on so so. You have diabetes. They go right to the addiction, 
And then they're like, well, we can't give any opioids for this, just so you know. And, and you know, it's just it's just the way they they lay it out there. I think people don't like. So, yeah, very much so. Anything else? Any other comments anybody has? That doesn't necessarily have to be a question. I think I I'm just processing more. You talking about the surgeon with poor bedside manner and thinking, do patients have different expectations in different specialties? You know that you're going to be operated on when you're seeing a surgeon. So you want their hands and their skill level. When you're seeing somebody for mental health or a different specialty, do you have different expectations of your clinician conversing with you and spending more time with you, connecting with you? Yeah. I mean, I think I've had many patients say this guy was a total jerk, but wow, he did a great job. And, you know, I, I think that that's really pretty funny. And, you know, I've been in a situation before where we had a surgeon who was like, everybody loved him, but, you know, things not perfect. And then we had a surgeon that nobody liked, but he did a fabulous job. So who do you send him to? Right. Um, and it, and I think it was patient specific. I would, based on what the patient was like, that's where I'd send them. But uh, clearly outcomes were better with the guy who was often not so friendly. Um, so I think there is that expectation. Sometimes it's the surgical stuff. But there, there's a flip side to that too, though. Um, if patients ask me, is this a good surgeon? I, I tell them, you know, any surgeon is fine if things go well. Yeah. You want to, no, but you want to have the sense that if things don't go well, that this this surgeon is not just going to drop you and say, "Oh, I tried." Yep. You want you want the feeling that they're going to work with you and and try and fix you. Yep. And that's probably where the compassion comes in. Yeah. Well, and it kind of goes back to trust too. Trust kind of ties into compassion as well, because you want that connection, so you trust your provider. Yep. Yeah, it's an interesting. An interesting topic. There, there's an interesting thing I'm seeing, um, you know, with, with not needing a waiver to prescribe buprenorphine so that, you know, when refills come in, anybody in theory could refill it if I'm not in the office, but they won't. There's just, even if it's for pain, you know, there's just this huge bias against it now. Yep. I've noticed that as well. That when people get called for that, they just won't, they on call, then they'll send it to the addiction clinic, say, well, you guys do this. It's like, well, it's your partner. <laughs> it's like, you know, fill it. Yeah. Good talk, Kurt. Well, thank you. It was, honestly, I learned a ton uh, working on this talk. And although it did take me a while to get it all pulled together, it was a, really very interesting. You know, there's one thing that the military is really concerned about this. So they've spent a lot of, a lot of time and effort um, training resiliency coaches. Yep. Yep. Uh, there's a little something in the chat here. It says there's more and more emphasis on the patient satisfaction and APMs too. I think this can also cause a conflicted feeling for being more compassionate. Yeah, I would agree with that. And Jenny. Oh, yeah, I like Jenny's comment that she kind of sets the patient up for what to expect when she sees somebody. Yeah, yeah it says, uh, you're talking about Jenny Orr? Yep. It says, I would sometimes set patients up by warning them that a specialist is very competent, but not the greatest man. And I've done that as well. I think uh, it helped them get what they needed without getting as upset. So they, and that's what I would always say, listen, he may not be the best at, at chatting with you, but, you know, he really knows what he's doing and, and please trust him. So. Um, and Craig, a uh, good book uh, we use as text in med school, HCL Leadership Development, is Charles Feldman's Thin Book of Trust. Hmm. Four components to trust, competence, care, reliability, sincerity. Well, I'm going to have to look that one up. I don't know, maybe, Craig, maybe you'd like to do an echo and, and talk a little bit about that book. I would love that. So if you if you have an interest in that, please just let us know. That would be, uh, I think, a great talk. Sounds good, Kurt. I'll touch base with you. Okay, thanks. I'd love that talk. All right, anything else before we let everybody get their day back? We will see you next week. It's Charlie next week, which is always fun. So uh, see us there for tobacco. We'll learn everything about how to, how to smoke. All right, guys, have a good week. And please reach out if anything comes up.